Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the spring edition of the Behind the Scenes Lecture Series. I'm Louise Aspen, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer at the UHN Foundation. I'm really excited to be your MC today, and I want to start by thanking all of you for um, joining us here today from your socially distanced location. I'm really happy to announce that this is the first ever behind the scenes presentation um, as part of the UHN Foundation. As many of you are aware, the Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation and the uh, Toronto Rehab Institute Foundation joined forces on April 1st of this year. And uh, we're really, really happy to welcome everybody to the new UHN Foundation community. So here we're committed to providing you with the most up-to-date information about our healthcare system. And this evening's event is a way of thanking you, our donors, for your tremendous generosity and support. Our doctors, researchers, and scientists would absolutely not be able to pioneer new discoveries without you and your support. And our behind the scenes lecture series are really designed to give you a snapshot of all the incredible work uh, happening at UHN. And today's presentation is no exception. As you are probably aware, Toronto General Hospital was ranked once again in the top 10 hospitals in the world this year uh, by Newsweek, and we're actually number four uh, in the world, and we are number one in Canada. So this ranking represents um, about a thousand institutions from around the globe and across four continents. Innovations that are taking place in our hospitals are helping more Canadians and people around the world live their best lives and donors like you make that possible. Today, we're really, really fortunate to have three incredible visionaries from the emergency medicine team, Dr. Sam Saba, Samir Masood, and Kate Heyman. They will share with you the latest innovations in emergency medicine. Um, before I introduce them or, or pass it off to uh, Dr. Saba, I just really wanna personally thank all three of the doctors uh, working with us today to present this information. They, they have been working around the clock uh, since, since COVID struck, and uh, I'm, I'm amazed that they're taking the time to join us today, so I really want to express my appreciation. Um, now, as you're all aware, UHN's two emergency departments uh, located at Toronto General and Toronto Western Hospitals are open every day, every hour, around the clock. Now, as our conversation unfolds, I would like to encourage all of you uh, to submit questions um, to our experts via Slido. Just follow the link in your reminder email or just below the screen. And we're going to dedicate the last portion of this event to your questions. Now, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Sam Saba. Sam is the Medical Director of Emergency Medicine at UHM. He's a leading national expert in his field and we're thrilled he could be here with us today and, uh, and give us an overview of what is happening in, in emergency medicine. Over to you, Dr. Saba. Thank you so much, Louise. It's uh, such an honor and a privilege to be here um, at this event. And I do want to echo my gratitude to all our generous donors for the support that they've shown us prior to and throughout the pandemic and beyond. Um, it's without question that um, every contribution that is made really helps us deliver the best possible care to our patients at the bedside. And for that, we are truly grateful. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is just a very quick snapshot of how many people it actually takes to run to emergency departments. The photo is by no means inclusive of all our team members, um, but this is sort of the typical number of people that are required for one shift in emergency medicine. Uh, between the two EDs, we serve over 125,000 patients a year, and that requires 90 plus physicians and over 170 nurses, as well as a large team of nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical pharmacists, uh, clerical staff, and housekeeping staff. So it really does take a, a collective multidisciplinary team approach in order to ensure that we can deliver care around the clock in both our EDs. Next slide, please. I think the COVID pandemic has really highlighted um, the critical role emergency departments play in our healthcare system. 
We have often heard that the emergency departments are the safety net of the healthcare system. We're open 24 seven. When people think of emergency medicine, they often, the images that come to mind are of immediate life threatening conditions and, and uh, you know, very high acuity situations where people are um, needing immediate resuscitation. And while all of that is true, our EDs play a much larger and broader role as well as a point of access to healthcare that is open 24 seven. And I, a lot of what we're gonna talk to you about today really revolves around that theme of, of access. Uh, in the ED, we are unique in the healthcare system in a sense that we have 24 seven staff physicians available there for expert consultation um, whether it is for immediately life-threatening situations or for acute exacerbations of chronic disease or sometimes for reassurance of uh, worrisome symptoms that patients are experiencing. Our EDs at UHN um, are, are quite unique in the patient population that we serve, and that's a, a reflection of the subspecialty programs that we have at UHN. Some of the, the services that are available at UHN are not available anywhere else in the province and certainly in a very small select number of organizations in Canada. And as a result, when those patients run into problems, um, you know, at two in the morning, they will come to our ED. So uh, our physicians and our uh, nurses have to be ex experts in managing not only emergency medicine, but also recognizing life-threatening conditions and emergencies of, of highly subspecialized care. What we'll uh, see later in one of our slides is um, that Toronto is actually booming, as we all know, and the population is expanding at a very fast rate. And that's putting an, an extra stress on hospitals and other in, um, infrastructure support systems in order to be able to cope with the increasing demand in the population. We have uh, often heard about overcrowding and hallway medicine prior to the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, you, we at UHN have not been spared uh, from this reality. And in fact, we continue to have unconventional spaces even within uh, the context of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, we've had to um, abide by infection control processes that have actually resulted in a reduction in our physical capacity. So we now have 40% less space than we did prior to the pandemic. And this is at a time when we have been uh, experiencing significant overcrowding. The pandemic also highlighted the importance that of supporting the most vulnerable in our, pop, in our community, whether it's um, elder patients in long-term care or patients who are experiencing um, homelessness and other um, mental health problems and uh, addictions that really place them at a, a disadvantage in the population. Our EDs have always been um, in, in a prime location that serves uh, many of our urban inner city population. And over time, the, the epidemic of homelessness has grown to the point that both EDs now are, collectively serve more patients who have high social needs uh, than any other uh, ED in, in the city, including St. Mike's. Next slide, please. So this is a really good uh, visual representation of the, the growing um, population in Toronto. Uh, in the blue, um, right in the middle, you'll see Toronto General Hospital and where one of our two EDs is situated. And around us is a massive growth in, uh, in the city. Many of these buildings are currently in development and others are, have been approved for development. And it's anticipated that by 2030, uh, in the next nine years, there will be 350 new buildings and that will bring a, a growth of 650,000 new residents to the downtown core. Um, and this is just uh, the people who live here. There, there's also a large number of people who commute into Toronto for work. The pandemic has changed that a little bit, but I don't think that that is going to be um, sustained uh, in the same way moving forward. And there's always going to be a need for people to work uh, from downtown. And, and that means when they experience emergencies during the work um, week and during their working hours, they will rely on our hospitals um, for their emergency care. 
Next slide, please. So in order to um, enhance access and create equitable care to our patients, we have um, uh, started uh, a number of interventions, uh, including expanding our physical capacity at Toronto General, we're increasing our physical footprint by about 9,000 square feet. We've also created virtual models of care uh, to really take that access to the next level and allow people to access our services from the comfort of their home. But we've also been very mindful of the importance of ensuring health equity for the most vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. And my colleagues, um, Samir and Kate, will talk to you about those latter two pieces. Uh, the UHN virtual ED was selected as a first program to pilot the potential future for a UHN wide uh, virtual care interface called Think and or. I'll let Dr. Masood speak to this as he is the expert, but this is a really exciting development that um, sees the um, integration of virtual care uh, medicine and also uh, artificial intelligence in a way that will facilitate access, but also help us risk stratify whether patients are appropriate for a virtual visit or um, whether they should be given advice to, to seek in-person care right away. In this under-resourced environment, in this challenging environment, um, if we succeed in the ED, then that is um, a good um, proof of concept that this can be scaled across the board uh, in, in all other environments in um, UHN and, and other hospitals. So if we can do it in the emergency department, then everyone else can. Next slide, please. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Samir Masood, to talk to us about virtual care. And I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and again, thanks for joining. I just want to take a second to uh, take a step back and just reflect on the patient care journey as it relates to the emergency department. And, you know, this is something which I think most of you would be familiar with, and it's been going on since we've had emergency departments. But the only way patients for the longest time have been able to access the ER is either by walking in physically when they're sick or by calling an ambulance. And what happens when they come to the ER is they're often been seen by a triage nurse and triaged as either having a life-threatening condition, which mandates care right away in a few minutes, or in many situations, they have to wait a few hours when they have less uh, serious concerns or lower acuity complaints. They're then seen by an ER physician, and in many situations, they're discharged home, and in a few situations, they often end up being admitted to hospital. Next slide, please. This happens at least 300 times a day, um, and as Sam alluded to, over 100,000 times a year. And this number has been going up year after year. In the last decade, it's gone up three times. We've got three times more of the population that comes to the ER despite not a whole lot new infrastructure. What isn't common knowledge, however, is that while the focus of ERs has largely been around life-threatening conditions, heart attacks, strokes, bleeding, so on and so forth, the vast majority of patients, in fact, that we see actually have lower acuity complaints. And these are the patients who often have to wait the longest, often also bear the brunt of hallway medicine and being seen in you know, less ideal situations. And in fact, the vast majority of these patients end up being discharged home after investigations. Next slide, please. Now, some of the challenges we've had with our existing models of care and specifically focusing on this population with lower acuity complaints and these issues go back even before the pandemic. And you know, we've talked a lot about capacity limitations. You know, we almost always are running above 100% capacity, seeing patients in stretchers, seeing patients in chairs, seeing patients standing if we have to, to get them, you know, the fastest care possible. At the same time, you know, certain populations, especially populations with disabilities, for example, have had historically limited access to the ED. And you can imagine for a patient who's got to come in on in a wheelchair or using a walker and has to take in wheel trans to come to the ER, even for a lower acuity complaint or a non-urgent complaint, that is a significant burden on that patient's day-to-day -day, uh, life. Um, at the same time, there's many populations that are disadvantaged historically, and for them to come to the ER, it's a huge opportunity cost. And I want you to think of the, you know, the patient who relies on his daily wages to, to, to make ends meet. You know, think of patients who've got childcare needs that they can't necessarily um, find support for. These are patients who historically wait the longest to come to the ER. When they come into the ER, they're often sicker than other patients. And these are issues that we've had for quite a long time, even before the pandemic. Next slide, please. 
When you add in COVID to this mix, each one of these different challenges and barriers is amplified significantly. And, and on top of that, you've got the infection risk of being in the ER, being in hospitals. And that's something which, you know, we're seeing more and more now that complicates things even more with, uh, with the, you know, the amount of infrastructure we have. And despite our best efforts, there's almost an inherent risk of having an infection exposure when you're waiting in the emergency department, either before you're seen or after you're seen. It's unfortunately part and parcel of, of being in a hospital. Next slide, please. And you know, all these different challenges and especially with COVID combined really gave us the burning platform and the impetus to pivot and think of virtual models of care and launch our virtual emergency department. Next slide, please. And you know, if you think, you know, why are we focusing on virtual care today? It's because there is a significant amount of high quality research that supports its use. And the research that's been done shows us that not only does it lower cost for a healthcare system and actually for society at large, it also shortens wait times for especially that lower acuity category that often is waiting for hours to be seen. And you know, we're, we're fortunate in some ways that we have um, research from the US and many European countries that has shown this. And we're a little bit behind this domain when it comes to adopting virtual care, specifically in the emergency department. Um, over the past year and year and a half during the pandemic, we've had uh, time to pivot and adopt a virtual care model specifically for COVID patients. And we've had over 10,000 patients seen via this platform with excellent results. And this has really allowed us to gain significant experience and expertise in this domain and be able to bring those resources to our emergency department. Next slide, please. So, you know, with that in mind, the goal of this program is not just to bring care to patients at the right time and the right type of care, but also in the right place. And the right place often is not the four walls of the hospital or the emergency department. And often it is the patient's home where they spend the majority of their time with their illness. It also allows you know, caregivers and family members to participate in patient's care. We've seen with COVID-19 that you know, many times patients would come into the ED and they were not able to bring in their providers because of isolation reasons or infection control precautions. At the same time, it also allows for faster and more efficient care and as a consequence reduces ED overcrowding and allows for improved efficiency so we can focus on the sicker patients who need us right away. Uh, a shadow benefit at the same time is also lower healthcare system costs, uh, which, is, which is great to see as well. Next slide, please. So um, where are we today? You know, we launched our virtual care pilot. This is a live service back in December of 2020. Uh, till date, we've seen just over 600 patients. And what's remarkable is that the vast majority of patients were able to be managed completely virtually. And you know, initially there was some reluctance both from patients and providers on how effective this model would be. But we've seen now over the past six months, this is a very effective model where the majority of patients can be managed without an inpatient uh, or an NED visit. Um, satisfaction both for patients and providers is really, really high. And in fact, even in the minority of patients who have to be sent into the ER, we're able to facilitate that pathway for them. So they're not waiting for as long as they would if they were walking in directly. We can order tests for them ahead of time and plan for their care when they arrive to the ED. This specific pilot is being done in conjunction with our partner hospitals, Sunnybrook Hospital and St. Michael's Hospital. And it's part of a larger province-wide virtual care initiative through Ontario Health, which we're actually leading and helping decide what the blueprint will look like for this um, across the province. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, what this entails for the patient, the patient can connect with our virtual ED either by going online to our website or calling in. Both options are available for patients who may not be necessarily tech savvy or may have an access issue from the standpoint of technology. Um, patients are then allowed to book an appointment. Um, we have 14 slots every single day, Monday through Friday. Um, once they've selected a time slot, which is appropriate, they then go through a screening questionnaire to ensure that their complaint is appropriate for a virtual care consultation and that they don't need to go to the ER right away for something more acute. To build in a layer of additional safety, um, we actually have a triage nurse that then triages the patient right away, um, gets some additional information to make sure that if they have an urgent complaint, something which is life-threatening that shouldn't wait for an hour or two hours to be seen, they're able to again facilitate that transfer that patient to the ER and plan ahead and order ahead those investigations, streamline that process. Um, for patients then through the virtual care platform are then seen by an ER physician. And you know, through a combination of you know, consultations, referrals, prescriptions, advice, so on and so forth, they're able to manage that patient's specific complaint. And the entire encounter and all the information, discharge instructions are then available to the patient through the MyUHN portal and also to their family physician and specialist as part of their care pathway. So it really allows a better integration for that patient's care 
um, not just the individual encounter, but also follow-up care for that patient. Next slide, please. This is some of uh, the feedback we've had from this program. And you know, this is really remarkable to see. And I think uh, it really provided a good testament to the value of the service. Um, you know, there are strong themes around access, as was alluded to earlier. And at the same time, also being able to take part in the care of your loved one. You know, I'm just gonna read off one of the quotes. If you look at the fourth quote on the slide, I'm disabled and have to use a walker and wheel trans to come to the ER. This service provided me with care within 30 minutes, whereas normal care would take a full day to go to the ER and come back. And you can imagine for this patient to have to spend a full day to come to the ER for an urgent but non-life-threatening concern versus being able to do the same from home. If you look at the last comment, you know, there's patients who during the pandemic had not seen their parents or elderly parents for a long time, but were still able to take part in their patients, in their parents' care rather and by being able to use our virtual care platform. So, I mean, I think this is a good testament and really allowed us to understand better what the needs of our patients were and how we were able to actually offer and you know, address these needs over time through a virtual care initiative. So, next slide, please. So, I mean, this is where we are so far and, and you know, we've done a lot of work to, to address patients' needs, but there are still some challenges and opportunities to improve what we're doing and really take it to the next level and the next phase when it comes to uh, virtual ER care. The first challenge we have is, you know, unlike in-person care, um, where we rely on the patient's vital signs, so the patient's heart rate, their blood pressure, the level of their oxygen, their temperature, we don't have the same amount of information when seeing a patient virtually. And you know, that often makes it complicated to provide them with the appropriate advice sometimes. Oftentimes we have to preemptively triage them to the emergency department out of you know, not having that amount of information. And oftentimes we can also miss triage patients because we don't have the same amount of detailed information around their vital signs, something they get right away when they walk into the ER. And as a way to understand this better and find a solution to this, what we're hoping to do is something called a smart virtual care system at UHN. Next slide, please. What the smart virtual care system at UHN is, it's the ability to leverage the best technology we have to provide additional information for patients to providers. And there's two examples here that I'll talk about briefly. The first one is using artificial intelligence to augment the amount of triage we're providing patients. So right now our process is fairly, you know, um, human resource dependent where they're seen by a triage nurse who's got to make that judgment call. But to make this more sustainable and to make this data driven, to make this evidence-based, to have the best amount of evidence to guide that decision-making process for the patient, we're hoping to use data from thousands and thousands of patients to provide a more robust way of understanding who is safe to be seen through this pathway and who would benefit from being directly seen in the ER. And that's where the power of artificial intelligence um, is going to be harnessed. The other thing, which is really exciting for me personally, as well as the ability to capture vital signs through wearable technology and through cell phone cameras, you know, something which is remarkable if you think about the amount of technology that we would have to use to do something like this, where patients during their consultation would be able to provide their vital signs to us. So we'd be able to capture how fast they're breathing, their heart rate, um, their level of oxygen, something which is really relevant in COVID-19 and make even more informed decisions for these patients and provide even safer care and more appropriate care for them. This also will eventually allow us to create a model which is not just better for patients acutely, but also from a province and system-wide standpoint is more adaptable and doesn't require as much of a human resource effort. Next slide, please. The other challenge is, you know, I can see in, in the questions we've had before is around, you know, health equity and how do we provide a system and a service and a platform that not only provides you with better access for the average patient, but also focuses on special populations, populations which historically and certainly during the pandemic have had, you know, even more barriers to care, the homeless population, the long-term care population, homebound patients. Um, and, you know, we are hoping to, again, develop an ecosystem where the virtual ED really becomes a centralized way of care for these patients. So there are no limitations to accessing the ED. At the same time, also being able to provide other providers, so patients, family, physicians who tend to quarterback their care, have a really intimate understanding of the patient's health conditions, also be able to connect with the ER right away so they can provide them with the best advice. And if they need to be transferred into the ED, that can be done in a very seamless fashion without any delays in care or gaps in care. Next slide, please. So this is the vision where the virtual ED would not only allow patients to connect via their cell phone and their laptop like we currently do, 
but at the same time is also a portal of entry for patients in long-term care home where the physician there or a family member can initiate a consultation for their loved one. So we can decide what the best plan of action would be for that patient. If they have to be transferred in, it can be a coordinated effort. So patients are waiting the least amount of time in the ED, especially or elderly population in long-term care homes, which you know, oftentimes is to wait for transportation. At the same time, we're also developing partnerships with our local shelters to say, can we provide these patients who historically have not had great access to ED care with a portal where at their shelter, without having to leave their shelter, can they connect with a virtual ED physician and, and get the care they need, right? And this is really important to us because we know these populations often have a difficult time accessing care in the ED for a variety of reasons. And oftentimes there's delays in care and difficulties associated with that. At the same time, we're hoping that, you know, there is continuity care between family physicians who, you know, who, you know, spend a lot of time with their patients and the ED. And so that communication between GPs and us and specialist care beyond that is one seamless pathway for patients as opposed to a piecemeal approach, which oftentimes we see in the healthcare system. Next slide, please. So I just wanna also mention that, you know, a lot of the work we do, um, it's innovative, but at the same time, we do spend a lot of time evaluating everything we do to make sure that, you know, our work is very robust and any learnings we have from that are to make it sustainable over time in a way which does not need ongoing funding and to actually create system-wide efficiencies to make this sort of a sustainable model. Our goal is to see approximately 5,000 patients per year at UHN. And hopefully by doing this and some of the work that we're looking forward to, be a leader in the provincial model of care when it comes to virtual EDs. Next slide, please. Till date, we have uh, you know, raised approximately $450,000. We've got some funding from the province given our innovative model of care and also a local UHN award um, given the work we've done so far and our learning so far. But as I've mentioned, you know, some of the you know, advancements we're looking forward to and some of the next phases we're looking forward to will the system require additional funding for us. We're again, hoping to you know, use the funding to focus on the artificial intelligence piece to provide more robust care, to be able to capture vital signs for patients, to have a whole data science team in conjunction with the University of Toronto and the Vector Institute to really take virtual care to the next level and make it something which you know, goes above and beyond what most of us have seen so far. We're also looking at using the funding to collaborate with, uh, with other partners, the shelter population, long-term care facilities, specialist care, so on and so forth. And at the same time to make sure that the patient's voice is always part of the specific initiative. And so we already have patient partners engaged in our current development and we're hoping to continue that to make sure that we're always aligned with the patient at the center of our initiative. Um, I will pass it on to Dr. Heyman, next slide please, to talk a bit about health equity, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tamir. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So I, I want to now turn a bit um, to talk about the in-person care experience at UHN. And one of the core tenets of this is we, we heard earlier how Toronto General in particular is one of the, the top hospitals in the world. And we want to ensure that we're providing the world leading care experience for all of our patients, um, particularly for those with social complexity, those who experience addictions and mental health diagnoses. And we know that people are utilizing our emergency departments um, to address both medical and social needs. We also know that for very high frequency users of our emergency department, they're, they're actually quite unwell and, and have a high mortality um, within a relatively short term so it's critical for their health that we're providing them with a care experience that is addressing their needs and also a care experience where they say, you know what, I would come back to this emergency department again because I felt cared for here and I felt that my needs were met. And we want that to be a given for all of the patients in our emergency department. As Sam said at the beginning, this UHM plays a really key role in providing care for this population in Toronto. And we're actually seeing more unsheltered folks, more people experiencing homelessness than our partners um, at St. Mike's or other hospitals in the core. And as Samir has been discussing, we're working really hard right now to ensure that our new models of care, um, including virtual care, is linked to shelter networks, as well as to other community partner settings that are providing care outside of the physical ED, so that the new care settings that we are creating are accessible to all of our patients. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'd like to highlight two innovations that we've seen in the COVID pandemic, both of which have been supported by philanthropy and, and function for the same patient population, but in quite different ways. So the first one is the Phone Connect project. And this really came out of the fact that one in 20 patients in our emergency department lacks an active phone number. And at the beginning of the pandemic, one of the first questions that came to mind is, if we're doing COVID tests on people who have no capacity to isolate because they have no connection to their community by technology, um, how are we gonna tell them their COVID test results? And, and then how are they going to isolate? And this question really shone this huge light on these existing cracks and massive inequities that patients in the emergency department are facing. Um, in the photo is Dr. Andrea Summers, who is one of our colleagues and has been leading this program and has actually led the implementation at UHN, as well as the expansion to Michael Guerin Hospital and St. Mike's Hospital. Next slide, please. The Phone Connect program, as I mentioned, was really born out of the COVID response but we've found through follow-up calls with these patients that having a phone has tremendous impact on their overall well-being and quality of life. So people have been able to use phones to receive COVID test results and to communicate with CPH, but they've also connected with addictions counselors, with social workers, with AA sponsors, family doctors, and their specialists. People have used the phones that are provided to them to attend telemedicine appointments, so this is really a tool that gives them access to that whole burgeoning group of services, including things like the ED virtual care platform. And we've seen people using phones to purchase groceries, to complete school assignments, and to receive employment opportunities. The phone is also a tool for crisis response. Um, so people have used the phones to access mental health supports, sexual assault supports, as well as to access shelter beds which used to be accessed in the Toronto system by dropping into a physical space. But with the COVID pandemic, uh, really meant people had to call ahead, which is very hard to do without a device. And perhaps one of the most important benefits that we've seen is the phones have provided opportunities for people to reconnect with family and friends. So when someone comes to the emergency department, we're able to give them a tool that actually combats social isolation, which we know is one of the major effects of the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. In addition to launching the Phone Connect program, we have also launched a peer support worker program in the uh, Toronto Western and Toronto General Emergency Departments. And the peer support worker program is launched in partnership with the Neighborhood Group, who is a community organization with extensive experience with peer support workers. Uh, classically, peers are people working in shelters, overdose prevention sites, and in mental health site settings. But the use of peers in the emergency department is relatively novel in the Canadian setting. And the peer workers are folks who have experienced homelessness, addictions, or mental health issues. And they're able to support patients by relating their own lived experience, which oftentimes can provide significant psychosocial support, but can also provide people with some real hope that there could be a future beyond the current crisis that they're experiencing. At UHN, we initially experienced working with peers as part of the COVID recovery hotel team, where peers are embedded in a group of healthcare providers, um, including many emergency physicians who are supporting people experiencing homelessness. And we recognized very quickly that there would be tremendous value in having peers in the emergency department. Uh, since the launch of the program in the summer of 2020, peers have become an integral part of our emergency department care program. And we've seen tremendous impacts as well in helping to de-escalate patients in crisis. The peers often have a really um, intrinsic ability to recognize when people are starting to become stressed by the wait time in the emergency department or because of unmet needs like thirst, discomfort, being too cold, or being in pain. And they're able to help support patients and advocate to have their needs met before things start to cause distress for the patient as well as the care team. Next slide, please. I'd like to share two, two stories that I think really highlight the work that the peers are doing. Um, and these are, these are anonymized, of course. Um, the first story is about Alex. So Alex uh, could be someone that we see on every shift in our emergency department. 
he came into Toronto General following a drug overdose. And as he recovered, uh, he spoke with the peer workers and, and had time to talk to them about their goals. And he said, you know, I'm actually not from Toronto. I live out of town and I really want to get back home to reunite with my daughter and my wife. Um, but I, I haven't got the money to do it. And the peers were able to connect with the patient. Um, they referred to the patients as clients um, to get a ticket back to his hometown through a community organization called Turning Point. And they were also able to help identify some trauma-informed services in his hometown and then provided him with a phone through the Phone Connect program so that he could actually attend follow-up with the Turning Point program and connect to ongoing resources in his home community. So this is someone who came into the ED involuntarily, but was really recognized by the peers as being in a moment where he was ready for change. They were able to meet him where he was at and rather than going back into an unsheltered environment in Toronto, which was not his goal, he was able to get back home, start to connect to care, and remain virtually connected by uh, having a phone. And, and this is the kind of exceptional care experience that we hope to make really normal for people who are otherwise marginalized uh, in accessing our emergency departments. Next slide, please. And the second story that I'd like to tell you is, is perhaps less exceptional, um, but also really demonstrates the value of the peers in our busy, busy EDs. Uh, so Lucy is an older woman who very frequently comes to Toronto Western uh, to seek supports for her mental health. And on one visit in particular, um, she was adamant that she did not want to leave the emergency department to go back home. Uh, you can imagine in a bustling emergency department with a lot of sick folks, this is a potential point of uh, challenge for the staff and challenge for the patient as well, because often this is a demonstration that someone's needs are not being met. And in this case, the peers had time to sit with the patient and they actually took her for a walk. They were able to provide her with a meal. And in that time, Lucy disclosed that she really feels very, very lonely and socially isolated. That's part of why she doesn't like being at home. And it's also part of why she comes to the ED. And after having a chance to share her story and connect with the peers, um, Lucy asked, felt much more ready to return home. And, and we actually know from the evidence that when people feel that their needs are met in the emergency department, including their so social and psychosocial needs, um, they're less likely to return to the ED uh, for a similar complaint until they have a new emergency. So this is another really strong benefit and the ability of the peers to unload some of the workload from our other care providers in a patient-centered way is, is a really phenomenal component of the program. So I'd like to leave you just with those two vignettes um, and, and continue to think about how we can expand both our in-person and our virtual care uh, to ensure that everyone is having an exceptional experience at the emergency departments at UHN. Uh, thank you. And next slide. Thank you, Drs. Sada Masood and Heyman for that incredible presentation, much appreciated. We'd now like to open up the floor for questions. And uh, I believe our Slido questions are about to load on the screen. Okay, first question. Imagine your work in the emergency room is forever changed because of the pandemic. What are some changes that are here to stay and should patients expect a different experience when being admitted? That's such a very um, good question and, and one that um, you know is, is actually not very easy to answer. Um, I'll take a stab at it, but I'm, I welcome some comments from my colleagues as well. Um, really one of the biggest changes I think that are with us to stay are the focus on um, infection control processes. Um, just prior to the pandemic, if you had come to our ED, you would have seen a lot of um, procedures being done and um, resuscitations happening uh, really without full personal protective equipment on. And I think that was just part of the norm in a busy emergency department. Um, and in fact, most providers uh, felt that they always had to prioritize getting to the patient quickly and efficiently over their own protection. 
And I think um, COVID really highlighted how vulnerable we actually are on the front line when it comes to infection control and, um, and potential life-threatening infections. So uh, moving forward, one of the things that will be very different is, is I think our PPE is here to stay with us. And, you know, that comes at a certain cost. And, and um, you know, I'll share a very brief experience I had personally as a patient myself in, in our own ED. And one of the things that struck me is the fact that it's incredibly difficult to connect with providers uh, behind all those layers of PPE. And these are people that I actually knew and worked with, but I could not recognize their faces. Um, there's a glare on the face shield. Uh, you can't really see where people are looking. And often uh, there would be multiple people talking um, and it was hard for me to identify where the source of the conversation is coming from actually. So to me, that really highlighted what an alienating experience it is. So um, it's something that I think is going to be very different and something that we have to be very mindful about. Uh, moving forward, we need to maintain adequate um, protection for our staff and for other patients, but we also have to figure out a way of making it uh, more of a human experience because it certainly is alienating. Thank you. The next question is, will the virtual ER still be available once the pandemic dies down? That certainly is our plan and I'm really hopeful that we're able to move forward. I mean, we've already had six months of this pilot, which has shown great results for patients and for the system. So we're hopeful that we will continue, not just obviously during the rest of the pandemic, but certainly this will be the way of the future. And, you know, we're putting in a lot of effort, both in terms of uh, human resource, but also financially and otherwise to make sure that, you know, the next year and the next 12 months and, and even time beyond that, uh, really allows for better integration of care virtually and in person. So it's one conduit for patients. Uh, it's an extension of our department. So it's not something where patients have to choose, but really it's an opportunity for us and vision care in a different way. And having the ability to have a virtual option, I think will make the lives of a lot of our patients a lot easier. So certainly you're hoping we are certainly gonna stay course with that. Paul Lucas is asking uh, the million dollar question. I have been vaccinated. Should I feel comfortable and are confident that I'm protected from the virus? So again, I'll take a quick stab at this one. Um, so, you know, the good news story within the pandemic is that the vaccines have really outperformed um, and have exceeded our expectations. Uh, a year ago, we would have, uh, you know, been very happy to have a vaccine that's 50% effective and to hear that, you know, we developed vaccines that are 99% effective at um, preventing death and, and critical illness is just really quite remarkable. Um, so on the positive side of things, I think uh, a, a fully vaccinated individual, meaning has received two doses of the vaccine, uh, really is uh, significantly protected. The, the one caveat though, is that, you know, it is not 100%. And also while the vaccine reduces the rate of transmission, it doesn't fully elim eliminate it. So people can still get the virus and pass it on to others at a lower rate uh, than unvaccinated people. But un unfortunately, it's still part of the problem. So I think we all have to maintain the, a level of public health precautions for an extended period of time so that the vaccine can take hold and really drive down the rates in the community to the point that we can start lifting restrictions. We're not there yet. How well is emotional care provided virtually? Great question. I mean, I think with COVID, people's mental health has certainly suffered and we're seeing more and more patients come in um, for a variety of mental health concerns. Um, you know, what we've done with the virtual care model is obviously not only assess patients, but also be able to support them beyond the initial assessment. So oftentimes when we see patients as emergency clinicians, we stratify patients and understand the support they need today, but also what they'll need going forward. And what we've taken with us is not only switch to different platform, but also take with us all the 
um, the referrals and pathways and accessibility beyond the ED that comes along with an in-person visit. So, you know, if you were to walk into the ED and see a clinician for a mental health concern, they may often offer you follow up with a crisis clinician or a psychiatrist. And we have the same ability through the virtual ED to be able to do that. So I think that's sort of where we're trying to make sure the care pathways are connected and not isolated where you know it's not a one-off appointment but really it's it's the start of a journey and the start of a process for that patient which may start off with the ed clinician may end up with their family physician um, after seeing a specialist perhaps so certainly it's been a focus for us i think virtual care is is uh, very adept at being able to deal with certain concerns like that we certainly also have the ability to escalate care for patients and send the ambulance to their home if we feel like they're you know they're in danger so i think certainly there's a lot of opportunities there to be able to coordinate care and the other thing which I think people tend not to understand as much is, you know, when we see patients in their home, it's a very different experience. We see where they're living, we see who they live with. Uh, we are able to really experience and understand better their circumstances and their situational context. I think that's what allows us to provide even more uh, patient-centered care, which often we don't really able to, we're not able to appreciate when they're physically in the ED. Our next question relates to uh, an experience. So it says, I had a great experience with your virtual emergency department. So that's wonderful to hear. What kind of ailments are best suited to a virtual appointment versus in person? Great question. Uh, this is a common question we get as, as we launch the virtual ED. And, and really the focus is on urgent conditions, conditions that would prompt you to come to the emergency department but that are not life-threatening. And so if you're worried about things like a heart attack or a stroke or bleeding, those would not be appropriate conditions. We actually have a list of conditions on our website. So you can go through a questionnaire, which helps you screen and decide for yourself what the appropriate condition is. We also have a triage nurse practitioner that then again provides another layer of safety and scrutiny to make sure that you're able to decide you know, what the best model of care is. And actually one of the things we're looking forward to, and I think Sam alluded to this earlier, is think and or. It's his ability to, again, you know, take the data that we've had in the past and really streamline this process. So patients will get a very specific answer, which is driven by data and driven by similar patients from previous experiences and fine tunes that process even better over time to really help you decide, I want you to go to the ER right away. I want you to call the ambulance right away. When is it okay to wait for an hour or two hours to see someone virtually? So I think this is sort of, uh, you know, something we're working on actively. Um, but for now, there's certainly a list of conditions on our website which can help you make that decision. Our next question is, will the virtual uh, emergency room be available at more hospitals across the province? I think so. I mean, I think so far from what I can gather, there's about 12 sites across the province that are part partaking in some form of virtual ER. Uh, certainly, you know, what we want to do is create more bridges between emergency departments and really allow for patients who you know, have one single access to, emer to emergency care, virtually at least, right? So as opposed to having multiple different virtual care experiences and platforms, the goal is, and, and something we're hoping to pioneer and lead across, across the GTA and certainly even beyond that, is to have a single door for patients across the province. Um, and hopefully this is the model we're looking forward to. So I think it's gonna be a model for anyone in Ontario. Um, and depending on where they live, we may streamline the process for them a little bit differently to connect them with their local hospital. So I think you just answered the, set, the next question, so thank you. Um, perhaps Dr. Heyman uh, can answer uh, this question. I have some old phones laying around at home. Could I donate them to the Phone Connect program? Um, yes, absolutely. The Phone Connect program is taking donations of old phones um, so long as they're accompanied by chargers. And you can send them care of Dr. Andrea Summers, S-O-M-E-R-S, um, to Toronto General Hospital. Um, and I checked in with Andrea before, and she wanted me to also emphasize that old phones are phenomenal. They will absolutely get a use. But if you are interested in supporting the Phone Connect, then a donation to the foundation also allows um, the flexibility uh, for purchase of more phones, as well as they, they of course, come accompanied by um, SIM cards. So donations are very much welcome to the program, either in phones or through gifts. That's great. Thank you. And are there any lessons learned that have changed the way you deliver care through this platform? I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about uh, virtual ER. Sure. I mean, the one thing I think we've, we've recognized really well is that patients want continuity of care. They don't want isolated care experiences. 
They want to see a physician who can then communicate with their family physician, connect with their specialist, and really coordinate care for them, right? Um, and that's something I think we're, why we're unique compared to many other virtual care offerings, as you may see across the province or across the country, is we try and really focus on ensuring the patient is well-connected and well-supported to connect with their family doctor and follow up provide them with the appropriate instructions and follow up with their family physician or their specialist, for example. So I think, you know, when we look at virtual care, um, what's going to be different going forward is that continuity of care and those networks that we build with different, um, different uh, organizations and, uh, and uh, healthcare providers. But it's not going to be something which is isolated or in, or in a silo, but really is well connected. And that's where we're, we're putting in a lot of effort going forward. How do we build those networks between long-term care homes and emergency departments? So that transfer of care that discussion is seamless. How do we connect family docs in real time with emergency physicians? How do we connect patients in real time with ER physicians and specialists? So I think those are the lessons that we've learned that patients want something which is seamless. Patients want something which is, you know, a single entry door to virtual ERs across the province. And patients want to have, you know, safe care, right? And a lot of the work we're doing when it comes to using artificial intelligence, being able to capture vital signs is to make sure the care we provide is safe at the same time as being more efficient and more accessible. So until this singular portal that you've been talking about is developed, how, how, do, you, how do people know which virtual ER to use? Should it, you know, do they go to UHN? Do they go to Sunnybrook? Do they go to St. Mike's? So I think as of, as of now, we certainly have, you know, discrete virtual care offerings. And so typically the recommendation is based on where you live and based on where you would normally go for emergency care, that's a program you want to choose, but that's really not the future. The future would be to have a common portal of entry and for us to tell you based on your complaint and based on where you live, the most appropriate pathway might be in a certain specific location. So I think from the patient experience standpoint, you know, over time, that's going to be a lot, a lot, I guess a lot smoother and a lot simpler where they would not have to pick and choose where to go, but often they would be sort of automatically in a seamless way directed to the appropriate service. But for now, because we are relatively discreet, um, I usually recommend to, you know, connect with your local ER as a virtual care system. You know, if you live in Ottawa, for example, connect with the local Ottawa hospital, but certainly, you know, we're open to serving any patients across the province. So the next question is, does the virtual ED program connect uh, to other virtual care programs at UHN? And I'm assuming it connects through my UHN, is that right? Yes, it absolutely does. And I gave an example earlier of the virtual COVID clinic, and this was a specific initiative for the COVID-19 pandemic that really allowed us to pivot our care and take care of COVID-19 patients. And the virtual ED actually collaborates with the COVID with the virtual COVID clinic. And so oftentimes patients with COVID-19 who need escalation of care, who need to be transferred into the ED are then often connected with a virtual ED for an assessment and escalation of care. At the same time, when we see patients in the virtual ED who may have a COVID specific concern or need follow-up for COVID symptoms, we're then able to connect them with our COVID clinic virtually as well to provide that sort of seamless transition. So certainly we already do connect with many of the virtual clinics across the UHN, but as we, we make more progress, the goal is to make it again, a smoother transition and sort of a unified platform for patients to connect with all virtual care across the hospital. Thank you. As a UHN patient, how can I ensure that I would be taken to Toronto General? in case of an emergency, even, even though uh, this particular person lives in Scarborough? It's a, it's a trickier one to answer because sometimes uh, the most appropriate thing is to go to the nearest hospital. So the Toronto Paramedic Service has uh, an algorithm that they follow. And based on the urgency of the situation, uh, so, sometimes some situations will dictate that the best um, approach is to go to the nearest hospital. Um, and uh, if if there if it's less urgent or less emergent and there is time, then the the paramedics have the ability to um, to override um, the suggestion of the system and to take the patient to their preferred hospital um, because their care is usually delivered there. But many times that's not optional. Um, so there's really no um, one hundred percent. Uh, way of ensuring that you'll always come to the Toronto General uh, if you're coming by ambulance. But I think that that in many situations that that is appropriate. Thank you. How can you ensure my medical info is uh, safe slash confidential and virtual and uh, this 
person is asking if we own Microsoft Teams software. So, um, you know, we take patient confidentiality and patient information extremely seriously. And, you know, before we endeavor onto something new, especially virtual care being something novel, uh, certainly in the emergency department, it goes through many, many months of scrutiny through our privacy and legal teams and significant number of reviews, both at the hospital level and also the provincial level to make sure that all the information is captured in a, in a confidential way and that it's not necessarily you know, going to be in situations which would compromise patient confidentiality. Um, we certainly have, um, I believe, licensed system Microsoft Teams, and so we're able to use that in a way which is confidential. And we've had several discussions and sort of meetings with, with Microsoft themselves and their representatives to make sure that all the information that is provided via Teams, video, audio, or written, is actually stored at UHN locally and doesn't leave our premises. So we're pretty confident in, in the way we've done things. And that's one of the benefits of, you know, having a virtual care platform that's part of the hospital, that we do have the ability to ensure that it's confidential. We've got the appropriate due diligence done as part of that to ensure that patients feel safe and secure when seeing a clinician virtually. You mentioned AI and uh, our viewers are curious how exactly that works and in what capacity? That's a great question. Uh, certainly an interest of mine. Um, you know, what we're hoping to do is instead of having to decide and have patients fill out a questionnaire and screen for themselves, where oftentimes they may misinterpret a question or may miss a specific question, we're hoping again to have the information we've had from thousands of previous patients drive that decision as to who should be seen virtually and who can be seen in person. And what's a safe way of doing that? And you know, we've done you know, obviously research over the last six months, but being able to leverage the experience of many, many thousands of patients over the last few years, we can make even more informed decisions and even more precise decisions. At the same time, you know, AI is also utilized when we're capturing vital signs through a cell phone camera or a wearable device. They're able to, again, you know, amalgamate the information from various sources to provide a more accurate uh, understanding of the patient's condition. So we're hoping those two elements combined will provide us with more information, but the potential really for AI is, is even beyond that, to really augment the clinician and the patient to make the most appropriate decision. So when you enter a complaint, that automatically over time would trigger certain follow-up questions and guide both the patient and clinician um, in terms of where to go with that specific complaint and provide the appropriate care. So I think it's really this idea of leveraging the experience of thousands and, and thousands of patients to the benefit of one patient. That's really the power of AI and to really provide the expertise of many, many clinicians over many, many years for that one patient during that one encounter, which you know practically is impossible, but AI makes possible. And then I think our last question, given that Canada lags behind other countries in virtual medicine, which countries have models that look most promising? So most of the work in terms of virtual care comes from the United States, uh, certainly in more, in more siloed areas. So there's certainly some health systems in the US which have done a really good job with virtual care for a small population. You know, our health system is, is a little bit different where we don't have very siloed healthcare. So, you know, we have to draw extrapolations and parallels to make sure we adopt the right type of virtual care model and take the right learnings. Uh, certainly some European countries like Denmark and Sweden have done a good job with those in the past as well. But the vast majority of work um, in the ED comes from the United States. Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. And again, a huge thank you to Dr. Saba, Dr. Masood, and Dr. Heyman uh, for taking the time today uh, to share your expertise with us. Um, when, when you could have spent the time with your family or, or maybe having a nap, I'm sure you're exhausted. So thank you again for your time and, um, and for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed today's behind the scenes presentation. It's really important to us at the foundation that we have the opportunity to, uh, to show you how your um, generosity fuels discovery in our hospitals. And you know, really want to uh, stress the impact you're having on people's lives every day. And, and there's nowhere more evidence than in, in the emergency department. Our next behind the scenes event will be held in the fall and uh, please keep your eye out for an invitation that will be sent early October 
and the recording of this presentation will be available uh, immediately following uh, on our Foundation YouTube channel, and should you want to see it again or share it. So thank you again for being here. Uh, stay well, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Have a great evening.